us, came looking for us, yeah. and he saw the heap of clothes, and we had disappeared. He went back and was sent. He wanted to send somebody to Danachadi uh, to uh, get the police or they, to get some help. He says the clothes are there. The people aren't. He thought he had <laughs> drowned. The present owner of the Malad site, John McGill, was then a boy on a neighboring farm. Did they mix with the locals? Well, they did, did now. Then at these football matches, they used to come to Cardor. My brother and I uh, played in the Cardor team, and they used to come up there uh, mostly on a Saturday, and they come up with uh, and horses and carts. And what the whole team? The whole team. And there were some of these refugees who was married, and their wives and all come up to support them. And you know, it was, well, they, they had a real good team and. Their goalie, I, I never actually seen better than what he was. Hey, boy, he was springing through those goals just like a cat. <laughs> <laughs> we, in fact, tried to get him for the do goalkeeper for our team. But, as you know, uh, their Sabbath day was on a Saturday, and I think that was more or less the reason that they didn't uh, own their release to come to us. But they, they joined in, you know, and was good sports. They were very much a religiously orientated community. But basically the important thing was to learn how to live together, to learn this kibbutz ideal which worked very, very well out there among the early settlers and it was the ideal way to live. Galilee, northern Israel. Situated roughly halfway between Nazareth and Tiberias is the Kibbutz Laviv. Today, it's hard to picture the place in the late 1940s when refugees arrived from camps like Malile and from other centers throughout Britain. The soldier settlers started literally from scratch on a barren, rock-strewn landscape where little grew. Thirty-seven years on, and La Vie has developed into a productive, self-sufficient community. A three-star hotel welcomes the thousands of visitors, Jews and Gentiles alike, who come each year curious to observe an orthodox kibbutz at work and at prayer, or perhaps just to savor the scented peace of the place. Bob Redner, now Bob Rave, has been here since 1948. He spent three years on the farm at Malayal. We came here knowing fully well this is going to be different from any other place. First of all, we couldn't even put a plow to the, to the ground. It was full of rocks. And uh, so uh, we uh, simply had to adjust to conditions as they were. And we had learned to adjust to conditions. I think that was the main lesson of Malayal. A kibbutz is a community where everybody gives according to his ability and everybody receives according to his need. In other words, you don't look only after your own interests. We look after the community interests, knowing that the community is looking after our own. In common with other kibbutzim, La Vie produces a wide range of citrus fruit and vegetables. But La Vie has one special feature. 75% of the world's synagogue furniture is made here. These pieces of wood are destined for a new synagogue in Los Angeles. As for its own synagogue, well, that provides yet another link with Elster. Some of the money which built it came from the sale in 1947 of assets belonging to the defunct Londonderry congregation. Who said there were only two versions of the maiden city's name? Bob Redner, as you were then... I hope this will be a surprise to you, because when we went to the farm in Malayal, yeah. there was one hut that was still undug out, and we dug it out, and we dug this out. Hey. 
You have that in. Yeah. Do you remember this? Look, we had we had um, maps of Israel. We wanted to come to Israel. You'll notice one thing: La Vie doesn't exist yet. It's supposed to be here. And what what was called uh... modern Palestine, showing the physical features. Yeah. He left that there. Surprising. <laughs> well, you've got it back again. Good. With our compliments. Thank you. But not all refugees left Belfast after the war. Many who had made it under their own steam, with a little capital or none at all, stayed. As the province picked up the threads again, the Jewish community contributed to the rebuilding of business and commercial life. Of course, this notion of the Jewish business stereotype was already old hat. After all, Daniel Jaffe had started it nearly a century earlier. But is this the only Jewish contribution to life here? What, for example, about the arts? Solly Lipsitz, one of the best-known faces on the art scene. Solly's an enthusiastic authority on anything from painting to jazz. This first wave of uh, immigration, they came here, and the first uh, idea was to scrape a living. Yeah. Now, um, they didn't know the language, uh, they didn't know the customs here, but they made the best of it, and... Uh, after a while, they achieved a certain amount of uh, economic... Uh, well, then, did they encourage their children to go into the arts? Well, now, that, w that was the point. They didn't. What they wanted their children to do was to go into some form of socially acceptable profession, things like uh, medicine, uh, dentistry, law... Like my boy, the doctor. That's it. That's yes. it. And if, for example, any of their children had suggested in any time uh, we'll say, becoming painters or actors or, or musicians. That was anathema. Uh, so, consequently, it was very, very difficult for anybody, we'll say, up to the second or third generation to go into that type of profession. Of course, things have changed. So, of course, they weren't now. encouraged, but there must have been people who managed to rebel against that, who, uh, did, uh, individuals who emerged. Yes, there were mavericks, of course. Uh, you'd always find that, and uh, I can name... One very important one for a start. There was Sidney Smith, oh, yes. the painter. Yeah. If one were to go into the Ulster Museum, you'd see uh, among the collection of important 1930s local painters that uh, there's a, a lovely landscape of Sidney Smith's uh, there. He became one of the foremost mural painters. And, in fact, in many liners, transatlantic liners, uh, Union Castle liners, especially those associated with Belfast, he was reputed to have covered 100,000 square feet of wall during his uh, career as a mural painter. There's one other vitally important area in the arts uh, to which the Jews of um, Belfast have made an enormous contribution. That is this uh, complementary element. I mean... Could you think, for example, of playing to empty houses every night as an actor? Could you think of standing on a platform and uh, playing music to an, in an empty concert hall? Could you think of painting a picture that nobody uh, is going to see? Are you saying so, that would have happened if...? Well, no, what I'm saying is that it is essential that you have an audience. That is the, this complementary element. And it is in that area, I believe, that the Jews in Belfast have played an, an, a part which is out of all proportion to their size as a community. Belfast nightlife has seen something of a revival in recent years. Theatres like the Lyric, the Arts and the reopened Opera House have been pulling in good houses. But there's one name guaranteed to bring a lump to the throat whenever it's mentioned, the Group Theatre in Bedford Street. Now a valuable showcase for amateur groups, this is where Ulster Theatre made its name. And one man who played a major part in the formation of the group was Harold Goldblatt. In the early 30s, he got involved with matters cultural in the Jewish community. It started purely by accident after the Jewish Institute was opened. And I think there was some discussion as to what might be done there. And Harry got up at one stage and suggested they should do something in the way of entertainment. Uh -huh. And somebody else said, well, you do it. And Harry did it. 
it was as simple as that. He had had no experience whatever of amateur theatricals, directing or acting or putting on a set, getting anything together. In January 1933, Goldblatt joined forces with companies led by Jimmy McGeehan and R.H. McCandless. The group was to produce a string of household names. People like Colin Blakely, Jimmy Ellis of Zed Cars and now Billy fame, actor and playwright Joe Tomalty, Jimmy Devlin, who is still performing regularly at the National, and the incomparable Lily Begley. But how did Goldblatt make the group pay? Well, he didn't. That's the answer. Um, it was in the days before there was any question of an Arts Council grant or a subsidy of any kind. And the theatre was kept going by Harry Goldblatt, purely and simply, with money, his profits from the Kelvin cinema that he owned. That um, It was in Fisherwick Place and no longer exists, of course. St. John Irvin and George Seals were synonymous with the group, but was it always an Ulster play? It was only the occasional thing, like the Void Shop, but then Harry wanted to do other things. He wanted to do Chekhov and various continental French plays and American plays, and so he would try and sandwich these in with a box office success an Ulster play of some quality. And that's how the group theatre managed. Goldblatt went on to enjoy a distinguished career in films. It was entirely fitting that he should die still working on the first day shooting of Barbara Streisand's Yentl. To most minds, this is the community's greatest contribution to Belfast architecture. The design of this synagogue caused a lot of controversy when it was built in the 60s. But why a new synagogue? It was built, I suppose, because the last one was, was put up in 1904. And in the 60 years that uh, intervened between then and this one, everybody's standard of living had gone up except God's. <laughs> and uh, this was a matter of some concern to Barney Hurwitz. This is his um, foundation stone here. He was, he was the president. He was the president. He was the president of the synagogue for 30 years. The, the foundation stone refers to him as uh, Nasi Hakahila, prince of the congregation. It's modestly translated as president. But he was a prince, and uh, he had the leisure, he had the knowledge, really, to run the community. And he had it in his mind that we were going to build a new synagogue. And uh, he asked my advice. I was the only architect in the com community at the time. And I said to him, do you want the best architect in Northern Ireland? Or do you want the best architect in the United Kingdom? So he said, well, let, let, let's try for the best architect in Northern Ireland. I can't remember who it was that I thought was the best one then. But I took him to see uh, a new church that had just been opened in Dunmurray. And uh, we went in, and he said, Oi, if only the Jews would be satisfied with this. <laughs> so yes. after that, I said, well, OK, let, let, let's try for the best architects in the UK. And uh, we went for a very distinguished firm indeed, York, Rosenberg and Mardell. Eugene Rosenberg had uh, worked in Le Corbusier's studio in Paris, and he came over, a very high-powered man, and he produced a magnificent model of the synagogue and some very fine interior perspectives. And we had a, uh, a synagogue meeting. And uh, to Rosenberg's chagrin, he found himself confronted with 700 architects, suddenly. What, all members of the committee? All members, all members of the community, just uh, all ordinary members of the congregation. I'll... Uh, I'll never forget the late Sam Jaffa saying, you're, you're building this place to knock the Gentiles in the eye. Goyim was the word he actually used. He said, it'll be a, a stone round the neck of a congregation for generations to come. In fact, it was paid off before the last brick was laid. 